Lauf. So what weight are you throwing, Douglas? Uh, this is still uh, pound and a quarter. So two things, with the wider bowls, you can throw them, I mean, there's some, oh, there, yeah, those ones are nearly a plate, uh, and I've thrown those, leaving quite a lot of clay underneath, to, and, and then cutting it away afterwards, so the clay is there supporting the curve and throw it. But I'm going to try again to... So um, that one on the edge has been cut away? Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to try and continue this idea of throwing them up and then turning them out. So as to have them finished right on the wheel. Yeah, because I mean that's another thing, what I was saying about um, all those things going into coming up with a form. Um, if I turn something, it takes me easily as long, if not longer, to turn it than make it in the first place. So that's been my idea right from the beginning, that I would make things that were thrown on the wheel. It's, it's, it's an economic factor for me in to reform, um, because it would they'd cost that much more if I turned them. And it's funny, if you make things like porcelain, people expect to pay more money for porcelain, so you can afford to turn those and charge more for them. So I'm going to throw this as a steeper... So has that got a flat bottom on it? Uh, no, it's got a curved bottom, but it's fairly shallow <laughs> to be with. Um, so suggested that Sven went for the uh, thicker rim to hold it together. Uh, I used to be rather poo-poo using rims because when I was a student if anybody used a rim it was it was throwing like a, uh, a piece rate worker in Victorian times using a rib to speed up the process and often what happened is it ended up being kind of looking rather mechanical uh, but if you if you do use ribs in the right way that isn't necessary that that's what happens uh, and I've got a mixture here of um, coconut shells make rather good ribs you, you've got these sort of compound um, curves uh, and then you know, pieces of bamboo or the flat ones, um, just a flat one. Um, so you need to pick a curl that kind of fits your um, size of your bow. I think I might. Did I? Ben, is that the uh, coconut one just on the wheel uh, by the porcupine quill? Yeah. Mm. That's your favourite one, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's your favourite one. <laughs> um, it's, well, there's another one like that, which, oh, perhaps that's it. Which is even my favourite one, but it got somebody trod on it. <laughs> so I'm going to use that. <laughs> flatter curve at the beginning mm. of this and then the, the curve gets steeper. I'm using rather more at the bottom and less as I come up.
to it, see if we can get it even wider on another one. interest in all sorts of different clays um, and clays vary so much in their various working abilities and you try these different things and you think oh I'd like to have a bit of that French clay and see how that worked with it or um, I've been watching a few of the uh, YouTube videos on Korean potters was I, was I doing that last year? I don't think I haven't quite got onto the Koreans last year. Uh, uh, it was sparked by this lady contacting me who was going to Korea to teach in an international school and she was an art teacher uh, but this school she was going to had a pottery department and they were expecting her to do quite a lot of pottery and she had a lot of experience in that. So she came, yeah, for a very intense <laughs> two hour <laughs> workshop. Uh, and I did ask her to, if she'd bring me some Korean clay. I could try it. Well, she brought them very small bits. <laughs> um, but they fire very nicely. And when you see what the Koreans do with the clay, you do kind of wonder if it, that it has some different working properties to it. shallow a bit too early on so I can't have the trouble getting to that clay right at the bottom. It's amazing too what potters can do with you know, what we would think of as really bad clays. My particular experience that was in Portugal, which I'm sure you've all heard about before. Um, and again, that's another um, factor. You know, if you've got really bad clay, what what are you limited to? Yeah, that's getting pretty much to the sort of shape that you're after. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit narrow in the base still too, aren't I? That. So the narrower you're in the base, the less clay you're going to have in that little bit of an angle. And if you've got obviously a flat bottom where you've cut it off the wheel and a curve inside, you're always going to have that extra bit where the curve starts to, to rise up. But the narrower the base is, the less there's going to be. Or if you keep your base very flat, you have less in it. And it's partly um, just a simple weight thing, but it's partly also that the pot should have a nice balance when it comes to using it. And these are kind of getting borderline for lifting off. Um, I know it's amazing again thinking of lots of these peasant potteries. Um, they just there's very few of them would use bats. They just they were just able to lift off you know, amazing things, either quite delicate um, things or heavy things using like these uh, pot lifters that you would have that fit in the bottom of a pot and therefore you were right underneath the uh, way 
able to clear them and lifting them off. Um, I, I've only legs. seen those in, in the southern states of America, but I think it must be uh, come from the low countries with a lot of the potters in places like Georgia and where they came from the Rhineland. But, um, I can't believe they just invented them in America. So this is. Yeah.